Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to EAB University's fall webinar series, which is funded by the USDA Forest Service. My name is Robin Osborne, and I'm coming to you from Michigan State University, along with my EAB University colleagues, Amy Stone from The Ohio State University and Dr. Cliff Sadoff from Purdue University. We welcome you today to the pre our presentation, which is entitled a real <laughs> Here we go. A realistic approach to plant selection and replanting in the wake of emerald ash borer. Our presenter today is very familiar with the problems that EAB has dealt communities. Dr. Bob Shutsky is responsible for teaching and research in the area of landscape horticulture at Michigan State University and has been involved for many years in aiding Michigan communities in finding tree and plant species that will make up for the damage caused by EAB. In addition to landscape horticulture, Dr. Shutsky's areas of expertise include the characterization of adaptive traits in landscape plants and the status of plants physiology during its establishment after planting. Before we get started today, please know that we, are, we welcome your comments and questions, so feel free to type them in the chat feature, which you can find by mousing over the bottom or occasionally the top of your screen. We will make a note of all the questions and we'll have Bob respond to them when his presentation is finished. To keep these free webinars coming, we need your feedback. At the end of the webinar, there will be a link to a short, voluntary, confidential survey in the Q&A pod that I hope you will take the time to fill out. And if you're one of the first 10 people to fill out the survey, we will be sending you an EAB goodie bag. But either way, we hope you'll give us your feedback. I will also be sending out an email after the webinar with that link in case you weren't able to access it during the webinar. For those of you who want CEUs, if you would like a certificate indicating that you participated in today's live webinar, please complete the survey and send an email message to Amy Stone at stone.91 at osu.edu. Certificates will be emailed to you within a week of today's program. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available for viewing soon at www.emeraldashbor.info on the EAB University page. You will also find the recordings for all our previous EAB University webinars. And today we are glad to have Dr. Shutsky coming with us. So Bob, please unmute your microphone, share your screen with your presentation and we'll get started. Okay, so I hope everybody can hear me. I can and, hear you uh, fine. Good. Okay, great. Okay, so a realis realistic approach to plant selection and replanting in the wake of emerald ash borer. This came about actually many years ago when we first uh, uh, experienced emerald ash borer and uh, uh, communities, landscape contractors, landscape architects were trying to look for alternatives that they could use that would give them some of the same benefits that they were receiving from ash, both white ash and green ash. And let's see here. All right, so when we were when we were meeting with with communities, different municipalities, different different uh, uh, homeowner groups, one of the things we wanted to make them more aware of what we're dealing with in terms of of the community. So the urban forest and green infrastructure were things that we were trying to promote. And so if you look at the screen and you see USDA's Forest Service, uh, Urban and Community Forestry Program, they talk about urban forests and we wanted them to, to uh, or one of the communities to focus on urban parks, street trees, landscape boulevards, public gardens, uh, riparian corridors, greenways, the things that, that uh, uh, house most of the the trees that that we're dealing with both native areas and natural areas as well as the constructed landscape okay when we looked at at uh, the definition of an urban forest that talked about ecosystems and uh, characterization of those again we wanted to uh, uh, make people aware of what ecosystem services are and how those services are are delivered by the trees we have in our urban forests and then also looking at, at the uh, uh, Sustainable Cities Program and their definition of urban forests. 
green infrastructure, we, we wanted to talk about green infrastructure and then again to make them aware of what green infrastructure meant to us in terms of the, again, ecosystem services and the ben benefits we were, we were being provided. And so the conservation fund had a, de a definition of, of a green infrastructure. EPA's definition was more focused on stormwater management. So it really didn't, didn't uh, hit what we were trying to uh, uh, get across. But ANLA, which is now American Hort, and talked about the managed landscapes and defined that in much more detail. And so, again, when it came to green infrastructure, there's a whole network of natural areas that provide us benefits, as well as the managed landscape. And, uh, uh, and then together, we looked at the, the benefit of these, these uh, uh, tree areas in terms of what they're giving to us. All right, so you look at the distribution of benefits of open grown street trees. This was uh, figured or calculated based on a 40 year lifespan and 60% survival percentages. And so the benefits of, of street trees, you can see energy savings is, probably, is the highest, uh, property values, stormwater runoff, air quality, and then uh, uh, atmospheric CO2 reduction. We wanted the communities to be more aware of the benefits and those benefits could be used to help justify what they're doing in terms of, of planting or replanting programs. All right, so when we look at green infrastructure, we look at the challenges that face us in both urban and suburban areas. Basically, we're looking at the, the challenges that face us on disturbed soils. Okay, so when we think about mortality of trees in these areas, 80% of the plant health issues are soil related. We're primarily dealing with subsoils, topsoils, and A horizons have been stripped off. We're dealing with poor, poor drainage in many cases, uh, severe compaction. And again, uh, these soil related issues have a, have a negative impact on the, on the trees as they establish. Limited soil moisture, water stress, both in too much and not enough increased temperatures, and then root horizons, again, that's constricted in terms of, of how a, a plant, how a tree could establish. Plant selection, one of the things that we, were, we were wanted to focus on is site adaptability. When we are looking at replanting, based on the characteristics of green and white ash, very versatile in turn, very site tolerant in terms of their establishment, we wanted to focus on species that gave us that as well. Uh, a lot of our, our green infrastructure soils are calcareous, so we're dealing with high pH and, and many times restrictions in nutrient availability. And then the last thing that, that are not in, in this particular image is the installation. Many of you know about true root level or the root crown level on B&B &B trees and how there quite often there's a false top and soils that have been been accumulated based on, on cultivation in the nursery and truly planting or establishing planting level based on root level is extremely important. And then mulching and then soil remediation when necessary. Other challenges that we faced in, in, the, uh, in an urban and suburban environment are vandalism, damage from maintenance equipment, Obviously, the threats of insects and diseases, poor air, water quality, fluctuations in temperatures, and then the intensity of rainfall events and, uh, uh, and the issues with stormwater management. So that led us to this approach in plant selection for the replanting. The first strategy was right plant, right place, and everybody is, is uh, really familiar with that. The second one was we needed to develop a diverse plant community. And as much as we talked about it, and as much as we've experienced it, first with, with uh, uh, American elm and uh, uh, Dutch elm disease, we really haven't approached that in a way that we would consider beneficial for other, other pests, like, like uh, uh, emerald ash borer in our case, and if Asian longhorn beetle came in to an area, this, the same thing. And then the last strategy, was the sustained health of our landscapes, looking at what type of inputs and outputs were, were needed to, uh, uh, to help with establishment and long-term uh, 
health. Okay, right plant, right place. When we think about right plant, right place, our concerns focused on monocultures. Many monocultures in our, our uh, landscapes, in our landscape development, quite often you hear comments about honey locusts being overplanted in urban areas, calorie pears being overplanted, maples being overplanted. We want to try to, to address these monocultures in a way that would, would be aesthetically pleasing to the property owners or the communities and then and give us some type of resilience when it came to biotic problems such as insects and diseases and abiotic problems which are the environmental factors that typically associated with soils, temperature extremes, flood, and drought. Right plant, right place. When we looked at, at coming, coming with actual plants to use on a site, the first thing we looked at is function. What are the user benefits? What does the property owner want that plant to do for them? Okay, it could be uh, any type of screening. It could be, be uh, dealing with architectural effects. It could be engineering benefits. But what does that client, what does that property owner want that tree to do? And the same thing with communities. What does the community members or what does the community uh, staff people want that, that plant to do. The second is the aesthetics, curb appeal. When we think about curb appeal, we have four seasons. What is happening in spring, summer, fall, and winter? What, what, uh, when community members see that plant during the different seasons, how does that enhance the complexion of their communities or enhance the complexion of their, their original or their property? Site conditions. We think about the environmental influences. The first site condition we looked at is soils. All right, what are the various soils we're dealing with and how can we choose plants that would adapt to uh, a diverse set of soil conditions? We look at exposure, okay, exposure to, to uh, uh, prevailing winds, northeast, southwest. We looked at exposure in terms of light levels. Are we dealing with, with uh, uh, full sun, partial shade or shade, and how does those light conditions fluctuate during, during the, the daytime. And then the last thing we wanted to look at is what is required to keep those plants looking good. Do these trees have specific maintenance requirements that may not be in line with the, uh, uh, with the particular property owners? Is, if there's maintenance required, is it feasible in terms of the skill left, skill levels of the people doing it? Is it uh, a question of terms of, of equipment needed? Or in many cases, what budget limitations would, would put a hamper on, on requ uh, required maintenance? Okay, the next, diverse plant communities. And this is one that took a lot more work and a lot more thought and a lot more discussion with the people involved. And so when we think about in the natural environment, we talk about, about uh, richness and health of the community. Uh, we talk about that richness and health based on the, the complex of species and how they interact with each other. The other thing we were looking at is when, if we have, if we increase species richness, then the ability of a particular community to withstand environmental disruption would be better. All right, and so when, when diversity, we got a little bit deeper into the discussions, we talked about three types of diversity. Taxonomic diversity, structural diversity, and age class diversity. Taxonomic diversity is pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. We were looking at what families we're using, what genera within those families, what species within those genera, and then what varieties and cultivars within those species. How many families were we actually using on a regular basis in, the, uh, uh, in our selection? How many genera, how many species? In many cases, we were using a limited amount of species, but increasing that diversity somewhat with varieties or cultivars. Again, not, not really giving us a large complex of uh, plants to, uh, to address this in the way we thought was, a, was appropriate or needed. For structural diversity, in our particular case today, we're talking about trees. 
but we also wanted to look at other plant types in terms of the structure. Where are they at in the uh, uh, in the plant and structural area? Are they are they ground covers? Are they perennials? Are they woody understories? Are they canopies? Are they associates? Where? How can we increase the structural diversity that will also give us some uh, uh, some benefits in terms of in any type of environmental disruption? And the last was age class, and this one was a little bit more difficult to convince people that we should be planting plants at different ages. So in terms of trees, it came down to size. For example, many of our municipalities have, have uh, ordinances that identify enhancement sizes and woodland replacement sizes. So if a, if a community had woodland replacement trees and they were specifying, in many cases, the minimum size for woodland replacement is two inch caliber or two and a half inch caliber. When it came to enhancements, many municipalities had a minimum size of three inch caliber. Well, when you look at the, uh, uh, the types of trees that were being used and the restriction on size for the particular planting, when I say the municipality ordinances, that primarily dealt with with projects that came under site plan review. So mostly commercial projects um, and in uh, the municipal projects themselves, not with sizes that were being specified for residential use. So, but what we try to do is to promote different age classes. And so instead of saying that, that there's, uh, that all replacement or woodland replacements had to be two to two and a half inch caliber, we were suggesting that they vary the percentage and say that that a certain percent, say 25%, could be one and three quarter inch caliber, 50% may be two inch caliber, and then 25% two and a half inch caliber. And so by varying the age class, we get different, different crown development. And then hopefully in terms of establishment, we would get uh, a lot, lot, or I should say less mortality rate and more, more uh, um, diversity in the, in the terms of crowns and how they're developed. The other thing we looked at when it came to this diverse plant community was community and de development, and we segregated cultivated landscapes, managed landscapes, and natural landscapes. So the cultivated landscapes were much more intensely managed um, in terms of of urban areas, the formality, a lot more specifications in in terms of the the complexion of that landscape and and how that complexion was uh, viewed by the community. Managed landscapes came under; they were were not intensely managed. They weren't formal, but there was some work of some sort in into those landscapes that separated them from. The natural landscapes were, were just left to mother nature. The other thing we wanted to look at in terms of diversity was the site versus the community. Some of the discussions were very much restricted in terms of site diversity and so as a result they weren't really looking at the entire community and so when we look at site versus community we could be a little bit, bit uh, uh, more flexible on the site as long as it addressed the uh, diversity that we wanted to achieve in the community. The next was what's, what deals with theory versus practice. And so there was an awful lot of, of uh, uh, speculation, theory thrown out there in how we should address, address uh, uh, diversity in terms of the number of species, the percentage of species, but in terms of practice, a lot of that wasn't feasible. In terms of when we looked at that the numbers that were talked about based on the theoretical approach wasn't practical because of availability in terms of the tree species and how that worked into what we were looking at from a design standpoint. The 10, 20, 30 rule, I'll get into that in a little bit. This was something that that uh, uh, Frank Santamore, if any of you uh, recognize that name from, from the U.S. Arboretum uh, a number of years ago, uh, he'll, he talked about that and I'll explain that. The look around rule and then blocking and grouping. 
The 10-20-30 rule, okay, nobody knows where this came from. In fact, when Frank uh, used to talk about it, he said it seemed like somebody pulled it out of the air. Okay, so the basically says that no more than 10% of the same species should be used, no more than 20% of the same genus, and no more than 30% of one family. So in general, the theory was kind of a good, good concept. And, and if something came, if a specific problem or disruption came into the urban forest, then roughly only 10% of the trees would be susceptible. Okay, so, so good in thought, but this, this uh, 10, 20, 30 had a lot of flaws. And so if you had 10 trees, okay, you could only have 10%, so, so one tree would be that, that species, only two trees could come out of that genus, and then uh, uh, the 30% of the family. So it's, it was pretty restrictive in terms of, of uh, uh, the size or the scope of the project that you were considering in your planting. So again, um, in concept, great idea, great thoughts, but, but in terms of execution and practice, somewhat questionable. The next one was the look around rule and uh, pretty simple and this was more directed towards homeowners, property owners, designers working on a small scale. Okay and the rule simply states that that when you want to select a tree you look around and if you see a particular species you plant something else. And so again limited use and, and certainly not a, not a, a method that's preferred when designing master plans or, or large complexes. And so, for example, when, when uh, housing communities were developed, this wouldn't be necessarily feasible based on, on the developing of those plans. But again, for the homeowner, it, uh, it worked quite well. You see, as you see a tree species, you plant something else. Here's a recommendation that was used by the village of Belgium in Wisconsin for tree requirements. And, and some communities try to develop diversity issues. And so, for example, on a particular, again, for site plan review, and then in this case, street tree development, if you're going to use four trees, okay, then one variety. Okay, so no diversity was achieved. If you're going to increase that to six trees, then you, use, then you need to use two different varieties, okay, 50% of one, 50% of the other. If you're going to plant nine trees, three varieties, 30% uh, of one type, and it gives you 70% diversity. 12 trees, 4, 15, 5, 18, 6, and, and on and on. Okay, one of the things that has to be defined this, and I don't have that, that definition, is what constitutes a variety. Is it in terms of cultivar? Is it in terms of species? And then how does this impact in terms of genera? We, we were developing in some language for a community here in Michigan, and what we were, we were looking at is 25%, a minimum of 25% of one particular species, but using multiple genera. Okay, and so in an increasing, increasing the genera or using 25% of one genera, uh, again, we were, we were going to try to address the numbers. But one of the things that, that, again, when it comes down to it with landscape architects, with what they're trying to achieve for a particular property owner, what the property owner wants in terms of the complexion of the landscape, we can, we can achieve some diversity but, but not necessarily uh, a large percentage. One, one discussion came down to, in some, in, in some sites, planting every other tree is something different. But again, it doesn't address the aesthetics and the complexion that the, the communities were, were used to in terms of their, their uh, uh, landscapes. Blocking or grouping, here you see, uh, in this particular case on top, the block of crab apples, in the case in the bottom, the block of red maples. But but in this became a little bit more feasible and uh, uh, achievable in terms of diversity. Okay, it doesn't follow the look around rule. 
but it creates aesthetically pleasing and create and creates uniformity in terms of the landscape. And so changing or, or having multiple block groups is, uh, is something that we can do. And again, it addresses the aesthetics and it also gives us some diversity. The sustained health of the landscape basically comes down to inputs and outputs. If we think about natural functions that occur in our environments in those ecosystem services that the, that the natural functions provide, one of the things for sustainability in the built environment is to look at these inputs and outputs, for example, water, nutrients, pesticides, waste that's generated, and the labor that's needed to maintain it. Okay, and then, and then again, in the environmental impacts, biodiversity, water quality, habitat, weediness, and invasiveness. And to know what the difference between weediness is and invasiveness. Weediness is when a plant may seed in close proximity to itself. Um, invasiveness comes when, when uh, uh, it sends its seeds or, or vegetative propagules across spatial gaps by either wind, water, and wildlife. And then the other, the other uh, uh, impacts that are uh, uh, either biotic or abiotic in nature. Okay, so with these in mind, this is how we started with, with a, identifying tree selections. Okay, so if we look at white and green ash, both of them and all the cultivars within them had desirable ornamental traits. Nice form, Great fall color, okay, in terms of, of size, reasonable crown development on a young age. A lot of the landscape architects, contractors, and then nursery producers that we talked about, Green Ash, is it produced a very acceptable crown at a young age at a reasonable time and a reasonable price. And so the uh, so from a from a standpoint of production and what you got for that two and a half inch caliber tree or what you received for that three inch caliber tree, everybody was real favorable in the crowns that, that they got from, from the ash species. Those crowns made a positive impact in their communities. The other thing that, that we look at ash is they were adaptable. They come from, from uh, uh, stressed natural environments, and because of that, very adaptable, and they could withstand a lot of the pressures that stressors that they were getting in urban and suburban landscapes. And then the last thing that they were available. For us in Michigan, the, uh, the ash species comprised about 18 to 20 percent of the urban and suburban forest. That doesn't count what, what native trees were out there in natural environments, but when we were thinking about out, uh, uh, trees that were planted in our built landscapes, 18 to 20 percent. One plant broker had told me earlier on when we were dealing with this that there was approximately 25,000 ash trees that were brought into Michigan on, a, on an annual basis. So quite a number. And so when it hit, uh, it hit us really hard. So again, going back to alternate tree selections, we wanted to, to look at this a little bit closer. So the monocultures, for example, again, with, it, with maples, when, when uh, Asian longhorn beetle was starting to uh, uh, make its presence known in different communities, for us in Michigan, maples can comprise approximately 55% of that urban and suburban forest. And so if, if uh, uh, emerald ash borer was bad enough, but if Asian longhorn beetle came in, Again, we would be devastated in terms of the amount of trees that would be impacted. So again, what are we bringing in? How can we increase the diversity? What are some species that, that give us a reasonable crown at a young age? What species are adaptable and, uh, uh, and from a standpoint of, of biotic problems and, a, and abiotic problems? The other thing we wanted to look at is size and availability. When, when uh, um, emerald ash borer first hit and we were looking for, for substitutes or alternatives, the nursery industry, because of the species that were being sold, 
had did not have the numbers or the sizes for these alternatives okay and they needed a number of years to ramp up numbers and again to ramp up sizes and so the communities who were specking two and a half inch caliper minimums for woodlands three inch caliber minimums for uh, uh, for enhancement trees the availability of species was very limited honey locust was available maples were available Norway maple red maple uh, calorie pears were available so we were we're almost gonna cause another issue in terms of monocultures based on the types of specs that we were receiving from from our municipalities and the type of trees that were being specced on our commercial projects by the uh, by landscape architects and, and general contractors and so again sizes and availability so what we wanted to look at is we want to look at crown development and we did this for several different species and so if you you see the one point or one and three quarter inch caliber uh, bur oak you see the the, the two inch caliber bur oak and the two and a half inch caliber bur oak and each one of those bands the white and orange bands equals a foot and so when we started looking at crowns a lot closer we saw that we can adjust we didn't necessarily need big calibers to get a decent crown and by having different age class sizes we were dealing with different different uh, abilities to uh, to establish successfully and uh, and again broadening the number of species we could use because we were going to some smaller sizes and those trees at those sizes smaller sizes were available we look at this with Quercus palustris, and again, you look at that the, would consider a two inch class, a two and a half inch class, and a three inch class. And if you look at the crown differences, not much of a difference in many respects. Uh, so again, we could go to varying sizes and get some of the, the same effect with these species. Like I said, we did this with, with many different species and tried to convince municipalities that you, if you limited the size or you're more restricted in the size, you may be more restricted in the diversity that you can achieve. Okay, so that led to developing the smart tree tip sheets. Uh, Bert Craig, a fellow faculty member here on camp here at Michigan State and I put together a list of plants that, that we uh, thought could be used or could be incorporated in one, we looked at native species, we looked at non-native species. So this wasn't an issue of native only. In fact, there was a lot of conversation by, by some members of the, of the uh, uh, communities in that they wanted to focus on native species. Our issue was that we should be focusing on adapted species. And as long as they didn't provide the species we were selected, were not not uh, uh, causing some other type of environmental concern, then uh, uh, that would increase the amount of, of trees that we could we could use. So native, we looked at natives, we looked at non-natives, everything had to be adapted or adaptable. And then again, were these available presently in the nursery industry? There were some trees that surfaced, and then I'll talk about, about them in a minute, that weren't being produced yet. Okay, and so uh, we wanted to make sure that what we were, we were going to talk about were available or would be available in a reasonable period of time. And so if you Google smart tree tip sheets, it'll bring you to this smart gardening website and it'll give you uh, the species and the, and the uh, fact sheets that I'm, I'm going to show you from, uh, from now on. Okay, so here's the general overall list. The other thing we did is looked at our native plant communities. From a native standpoint, we wanted to, to look at where trees came from, what were their natural environments, and how could we deal with, with uh, uh, again, more diverse species that may not be in the mainstream, but yet would be available. And so, when we think about dominant ecological communities, now this can, uh, can uh, apply to anywhere around the country, all right? We were looking at the dominant communities 
we were looking at canopy species, which tend to be the characteristics of the, of the community. We looked at their associates, and, uh, um, and then in some cases, woody understory, uh, the herbaceous understory that's typical for the community. For us in the Southern Great Lakes region, the dominant upland systems consist of maple basswood, oak hickory, beech maple, the oak barrens, and the mesic prairie. Our wetland systems, basically three, is the Great Lakes floodplain forest, the shrub swamp, and the wet meadow. So for tree species, we looked at two communities. And the reason, reason we looked at these communities, because these were the more stressed sites or stressed communities in our particular region. The oak barrens, the, the oak savannas or oak barrens, is the transition between the upland forests and the prairies. They tend to be, be windy. The soils tend to be somewhat, or they, or they tend to be droughty. And, uh, uh, and so when we were looking at the, uh, uh, the stress associated with the species in the oak barrens, some plants started to, to surface. The next one we looked at was the wetland systems. And for us, the Great Lakes floodplain forest has species, again, that were uh, uh, tolerant to stressed soils, tolerant, tolerant to seasonal flooding, seasonal drought, and again, gave us a list of species. Okay, from the Oak Barrens, we looked at, at uh, uh, what was native in that particular area, and we see white oak, we see northern pin oak, ellipso sedalis, the bur oak, red oak, and then black oak. Well, black oak wasn't or isn't readily available in the landscape trades, but the other four are. We looked at the associates and we found Acer nagundo, box elder, uh, paper birch, Juniperus virginiana, eastern red cedar, and then Tilly americana, the, the American basswood. From the Great Lakes floodplain forest, we looked at red red maple, silver maple, and then obviously green ash. Well, green ash, because of its, its tolerance, uh, its site tolerance, we looked at red maple, which we were already using, but we were cautious about, about specking more red maple because of the, the number, the sheer numbers of maples that were being used. Acer saccharinum, silver maple, we didn't really recommend because of its weak wood. Uh, we have more issues with with it breaking apart in in windstorms and other things, and so we were and it's with its root systems in urban areas, and so we we shied away from from silver maple. However, the uh, uh, the Freeman hybrids, the crosses between red maple and silver maple, we were looking at those a lot closer. When we looked at the associates, okay. Celtis occidentalis, hackberry, kind of rose to the surface. For us, hackberry was, was a more utilitarian type tree, okay? Something that, that you could put, put in, the, in the outlying areas, may not necessarily want it in, uh, uh, in, in prime areas, in high profile areas, but again, something that was versatile and adaptable. Honey locust, again, we're looking at the fact that honey locust is used quite a bit, and we were kind of shying away from that. Kentucky coffee tree. Kentucky coffee tree is a, a, a large tree, adaptable. And for Kentucky coffee tree, we're thinking about, okay, so this could be used in park systems, in outlying areas, may not necessarily want it in close proximity in, in, in uh, small street lawns or in close proximity to business districts because of the of the uh, uh, the petioles and the uh, and in the debris from from uh, leaf drop, Quercus bicolor, the swamp white oak rose again, and then uh, uh, bur oak and then Tilly americana. So we drew upon on our native plant communities for some additional suggestions and potential species to identify for diversity. All right, so here we go into the into the different groups. So American elm, okay, Dutch elm disease kind of kind of took this off the map for a long long time. 
but we see some some nice additions coming back. We have the vase shape. We have a, a reasonable crown. And so if we, or when we established disease resistance, we were looking at some of these straight American elm cultivars in terms of Valley Forge, uh, New Harmony, and, and uh, potentially bringing them back into our, our product mix. One of the things that, that people had said or, and had looked at, they tend to be real lacy when it comes to the smaller sizes, the two to two and a half caliper, and it takes a while for them to, to develop what they considered an acceptable uh, crown, more of acceptable crown. American hopcorn beam, Ostrea virginiana, this is one of our, our uh, uh, natives, and it's native on dry areas up in, in, uh, uh, in northern Michigan. You also find it in, in this dry, moist uh, valley or lower slopes. It prefers moisture but tolerates dry soils. And again, when we think about this, uh, nice, nice fall color. No flowers to speak of. The hops are, give you an, an interesting characteristic. And so we are starting to look at Astraea a lot closer as a potential tree. Its crown size and its crown shape worked well as a street tree, and it could be uh, lower branches could be uh, uh, elevated. Plus that it tolerates some light shade. Thought, well, we can, we can use it in urban areas where, where buildings may cast some partial shade throughout the season. American linden or basswood, we looked at this a little bit closer. We, we, you look at Redmond, you look at Boulevard, uh, worked well in many sites. The only problem that we found with, with American basswood or, or linden was its issues with Japanese beetle. And so if we had had a, a Japanese beetle problems in the area, we were going to shy away from using basswood. But if it was not an issue, then basswood would give us a substantial crown and uh, uh, it would have the hardiness, it will have the, the, the site tolerance that we were looking for. The hybrid elms, when we look at what came out of, of uh, the Morton Arboretum with George Ware and a lot of his work, an awful lot of, of uh, uh, acceptable trees. When we look at Acc Accolade and uh, uh, Triumph, some of these other other hybrids that George was was in, in involved in in producing again increased the amount of, of species that we could look at. When it came to the hybrids, though, again, uh, people were looking at it as a young crown and uh, determining whether whether it would be acceptable in their particular situation. Ginkgo. The thing that's interesting about ginkgo, most of us throughout our careers have only seen century ginkgo or Princeton century. And so when, we, when we're, we're talking about ginkgo to, uh, uh, to our students, every one of them think it's a very narrow upright tree. But straight species ginkgo is very broad in terms of its crown. And so we're trying to promote the use of autumn gold, magyar, some of the new introductions that have been introduced for its widespread crown not its narrow spread crown. And obviously, ginkgo is, is relatively pest free. The only thing that, that we need to, to, to make sure when we're, we're selecting ginkgo is that we're using male selections because the, uh, um, the female selections withered fruit and the fruit could be somewhat um, obnoxious in the fall season, both from, and some people, people uh, uh, will get a rash from it and then, uh, and then the odor itself when it's when it's ripening. But again, ginkgo gives us some some really nice possibilities, especially with the broad crown ginkgo introductions that are happening now. And again, it's very adaptable to to different soils, and uh, uh, and it's very hardy. Okay, this is one that was not used quite a bit, and uh, but it has now gained in popularity, and it's the northern pin oak. Quercus elliptus sodalis. And the reason it has gained popularity is because it is not native on high pH soils. And so if we, we look at iron chlorosis that we've, we see quite often 
in our particular area on pin oak, Quercus palustris, Elliptosedalus naturally grows on those soils, and so we don't have the iron chlorosis issues. In other words, we don't have the additional labor and the additional treatments that's necessary if we have Quercus palustris. And so northern pin oak is gaining in popularity. Many more nurseries have started to plant this. It tolerates dry soils, uh, tolerates some moisture. So again, it's, it's a, a, a nice replacement if the typical branching habit and the, uh, uh, and the crown development of pin, pin oak is desirable. Okay, silver linden, the tilia tomentosa. The thing that was most impressive about, for us, the tilia tomentosa is that it doesn't have the Japanese beetles issues that tilia cordata or American basswood does. Now, I've heard from, from people in the region, they say they still get some feeding with Japanese beetle, but not the skeletonization that occurs on, uh, on their, their tilia cordatas or their, or their basswood. Okay, the other thing that's good about, about uh, silver linden or silver leaf linden, it's heat and drought tolerant. Okay, it's, it's uh, uh, very adaptable for, for urban conditions, suburban conditions. This is a broad crown, so it's large crown, larger leaves. Some people balk at the, the fact that the size of the leaf may increase in uh, fall cleanups. But, but again, silver linden, attractive plant, nice uniformity in its, in its crown development, and its adaptability helps us uh, uh, quite a bit. Scarlet oak, Quercus coccinea, uh, is, an, is an eastern uh, native. We see a little bit of scarlet oak here in Michigan, and it, it resembles pin oak. If you look at its natural range and the extent of it, uh, quite nice in terms of its versatility around, around the area. Its hardiness for us is, is fine, so I would imagine it could, it could be, to be used in some of the other Great Lakes states. Uh, not the, the pH, pH issues that we see with, uh, uh, with pin oak, and uh, uh, again, a very, very adaptable. And its red fall color is very, uh, uh, very interesting and uh, uh, acceptable in the landscapes in, in autumn. Sweet gum, here's one that uh, um, has mixed reviews. For example, it's not, if you look at its native range, you can see where, where it exists. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey and uh, sweet gum was all over the place in terms of the natural areas. And the thing that we liked about sweet gum is it's tolerant to, to poor soils, tolerant to, to uh, uh, heavy compacted areas, and it worked out real well for us. We've used it in Michigan with, with some success. When I say some success, is on some of the exposed sites on the east side of the state in the Detroit area, we had heavy uh, um, of damage and mortality, but in other areas, it's, it's grown fine. And so moraine tends to be the most hardiest of the, uh, uh, of the selections. And so again, when we're thinking about, about sweet gum, we're a little selective on the sites we use it on, but we still are using it. And, uh, and as long as the sites aren't extremely exposed, then we, we haven't had any problems. We usually consider the East Lansing area colder than, uh, than the opposite side of the states. And we have several sweet gum on campus that, uh, uh, that do very well. Tulip tree, this is one of those natives that again has mixed um, reviews. And the reason it has mixed reviews is because of its wood strength. All right, and so when we were talking about using tulip tree, we were recommending its use for park systems, for, for large areas, not in close proximity to buildings or other uh, facilities that may, that if, if winds came through and, and it broke apart, either through wind damage or ice damage, it wouldn't cause us any issues. It's a fast growing tree, it's a tall growing tree, uh, adaptable for the most part, 
but uh, but again, being sensitive to wood strength, we were very selective in where we recommended its its use. Tupelo, Nyssa sylvatica. This was talked about again because of its adaptability to poor soils. However, is extremely difficult to transplant. We've 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 uh, uh, we have several Nyssa on campus. And uh, uh, when they came in, the ball, soil balls were oversized for the particular plants. Some plants were started in containers, bumped up in containers. And then uh, when they were transplanted in the field, the minimum, minimal amount of root disturbance was important to get them coming in and to establish. Some of them has established well. Some of them have, have uh, lagged behind. Uh, nice tree in terms of its adaptability, nice tree in terms of its fall color and uh, some of the ornamental characteristics, but in terms of transplantability, uh, we have to be a little bit cautious in making sure that, again, oversized soil balls, container plants that, uh, uh, that would withstand transplanting in a, an establishment. And so there, there have been there's been mentioning of other trees, other forest trees, some of the nuts, uh, hickories and that. But again, the transplant issues associated with some of those species uh, causes us to be cautious on recommending them. Uh, they may be available in some cases as young seedlings, but again, uh, when we're dealing with tap roots and, and other issues with the root system and uh, uh, some issues with establishment, Again, we were, we were trying to stay away from them. And so uh, the oaks. When we looked at the oak savannas, there's a few species here that I would have mentioned. One bur oak uh, tolerates drought, tolerates intermittent flooding. We tend to see uh, oak or, the, or bur oak being used quite a not, lot now on stress sites. And so bur oak was available or is available at different sizes. And, uh, uh, and again, we started to see an increase in its use. Chinkapin oak is another, another one of those oak savanna uh, plants. Interesting from a leaf shape, interesting from a, from a crown, large crown, wide, tolerant to diverse soils, full sun, partial shade, tolerant of alkaline soil. So we're seeing some of the issues that we may have with some species due to high soil pH, we wouldn't see that with the chinkabin. And so again, it's one of those oak savanna species that we're looking at seriously of bringing in to a landscape, in their landscape context because of its site tolerance. Shingle oak, same thing. Look at the, the native range of shingle oak. It's in that, in that oak savanna type area uh, down around the the southern or the in Indiana, Illinois, and uh, um, again giving us tolerance to drought, adaptable to soils, and uh, uh, a decent crown, a glossy leaf. And so again, but shingle oak isn't that available, and uh, uh, so again, hopefully, nursery industry would increase it. The last two species that I want to talk about are the two deciduous conifers, dawn redwood and uh, uh, taxodium bald cypress. So metasequoia, uh, interesting plant. I've seen this used as a street tree in Minnesota, and uh, uh, and actually it did quite well. The only restrictions that I that I I think with this particular plant is the buttressing of the base. Okay, when you look at the trunk at the base and how expanding, it doesn't do well in narrow planting areas. And so again, in parks or in areas with uh, uh, large street lawns or in areas in, in median strips where you have a substantial amount of, uh, uh, of property underneath it, metasequoia does real well. Uh, the, the, uh, quite often we, we talk about when we use metasequoia, People will ask us how come that that evergreen or how come that conifer died in the uh, in the fall with leaf drop. But again, very adaptable. Uh, it does well for us. 
and, and it's something worth considering. And the last is Vault Cypress, kind of the same type of uh, uh, situation as Dawn Redwood, uh, the buttressing of, the, of the, uh, uh, the base of the plant. With Vault Cypress, the, the, the ones that we have here on campus and uh, are doing quite well, the, the knees do come up at other places in the beds. And so when we're, when we're looking at using this plant, we have to, to plan enough space, plan enough bed space, so that when it starts throwing up its knees around the base of the plant, that, uh, uh, that it doesn't have a negative impact on things, or things around it. And so, so that's it for the, for the uh, presentation. Again, when we think about how we addressed or, or what kind of strategies we needed to come up with for, for addressing the, the problems associated with the loss of ash. So right plant, right place, adaptability, adaptability, adaptability. Uh, diverse plant community, we wanted to make sure that we were increasing the families, the genera's that we're using in the, in the, uh, the planting, still, still being sensitive to the aesthetic issues that uh, um, that a, a person or a commer or a company would want on, or a municipality would want on their sites, and then the last thing, trying to identify species that needed a minimal amount of inputs and generated a minimal amount of outputs, so that we were being able to maintain them adequately with with limited resource, limited budgets that uh, uh, that many of us are subjected to in our municipalities. And with that, thanks very much for, for listening. I hope there is some information. One last point in that, that I'm, I'm not sure where you are in the part of the country that you're dealing with this, but I think the, the, the important thing is, is to look at, look at the stressed plant communities, your natural stressed plant communities that you have in your particular location. And, uh, uh, and so some species may jump out at you for that. And then also we know that the, the non-natives, the introduced species that have been great performers for us, and, and again, looking at capitalizing on some of those, those species to, uh, uh, to increase the product mix that we have in our, in our urban and suburban landscapes. And with that, thanks very much. Thanks, Bob, I appreciate it. Um, I do have some questions. Uh, we had one question. Define Lacey regarding American elm. Okay, when uh, when you look at it in production, okay. So the what, what we call the feathers, there's a there's a density, a core density in close to the crown. So in other words, it throws out a lot of small branches close, and then the laciness, the extended branches come beyond that core, come out fairly far. And so what happens is that when you're looking at density, it seems like the density is close to the trunk and you don't get wide spreading branches. And so when, when we've looked at or we've used um, those elm hybrids or those elm cultivars, we've done a fair amount of interior pruning, thinning out close so that you can see the scaffold structure of the of those wider branches and so the laciness is tight density close you get a little bit loose uh, branching towards the towards the outside and some people uh, want more structure because they're used to an ash they're used to a maple where uh, uh, where you don't have that that looseness Okay, we've also had a request, and I will send that out, of the link to the Smart Gardening um, information that you put out, Bob, um, and the, you know, where they can see the PDFs. So I just want to let you know that. Um, it's, uh, we have a couple other questions. <clears throat> Do you as, far, as far as that concern, if they just go into Google and type in Smart Tree Tip Sheets, it'll come right up. Okay. Now, I had a question. Do you see basswood leaf miner activity on basswood in Michigan, either in landscape and or in woodlots? We see it a little bit. And, uh, and again, so it's, it's one of those, those uh, uh, issues that, uh, uh, in, fact, in fact, I was at a program uh, last week 
where we're we're seeing it. It's not not extremely widespread, but it but it is is uh, present. And uh, and the person, one of the arborists who was doing the presentation, uh, identified some some uh, sprays that would help minimize it. But yes, we we do see it. All right, and would you, uh, Cliff Sadoff um, asks, he would be interested to hear your restrictions on Bradford pear and Norway maples that are considered invasives by some. Okay, so let's, let's, we'll start with Norway maple. Okay, Forest Service did some research many years ago and looking at the, the, the spread of Norway maple seeds and found out that that a vast majority of the seeds fall in close proximity to the plant. Now, when, when people talk about, about uh, Norway maple as being invasive, the, the seeds fell in close proximity. I think there was, it, it, there was a, uh, a distance in there that was 150 feet, something like that. So the seeds fell, seedlings germinated, and they began to spread. And so when you look at where Norway maple has been has spread into natural areas, the Norway maple, the original parents, were in close proximity. So when we're when we're talking about Norway maple, Norway maple, in fact, in, in many cases the, the, the comparison is Norway and sugar maple. Sugar maple cannot grow satisfactorily on the soils that Norway maple can. And so when we're looking at stressed urban sites, Norway maple is the desirable species. As long as we use Norway maple, okay, in areas that are not in close proximity to natural areas, we don't have an issue with it spreading. And so in the past, Norway maple was used everywhere. And so the areas in Michigan where we've seen it, and we've seen it clear up to the to the UP and Mackinac Island. There was a study that was done on Mackinac Island where Norway maples were, were planted adjacent to the state forest lands and it has spread in there. So we can use Norway maple effectively in terms of an urban tree if we don't place it next to natural areas along uh, riparian corridors. And so if, if, and I can show you parking lots where where it is not going to have a negative impact on our, our natural landscape. So the, the question with Norway maple is, is it can be used effectively, but the key is on the proper location. Now, Carol repair on the other hand, okay, when we look at Carol repair and, uh, um, and we see it, we don't see it really widespread in Michigan. I've seen it in Ohio. I've seen it in in, uh, in in other southern areas. I've seen it along the eastern seaboard. Okay, so the issue with with calorie pear is the seeds and what the birds are doing with it. And so, if we look at it from a from a standpoint of regionality, it may be an issue, but it may not be an issue in every region. And so, uh, again, in in the in what I've seen in southern Ohio in the eastern seaboard it has spread significantly we don't see that happening uh to a big part in michigan it, and i'm not sure about about other areas as we get further north its hardiness may be be somewhat restricted uh but again because of the seed is picked up or the fruit is picked up by birds anytime we're dealing with with uh, uh seeds that transfer by wind water or wildlife across those spatial gaps, it could be an issue. So the, the thing about uh, calorie pear again, when we, when we look at it and how extensively it's used, uh, again, it could be an issue of, of location. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to try putting, I'm not sure if this will work. Okay, I put in the chat pod for everyone the link to the survey. And again, I will be sending this out um, in an email after the webinar in case you aren't able to get this. Sometimes it's hard to make this link work on the chat pod. But I think that's it. Oh, wait, we 
might have one more. Oh. Sadoff says, thank you for clarifying the restriction on the use of normally maples and Bradford pears. We did have another comment too that baldy cy bald cypress knees are an are anti lawnmower tactics. So, <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> okay. Um, folks, also in the chat pod, I have provided you with um, Bob Shetsky's email address in case you have other questions you think of later. And I will also provide that in the email that I'll send out afterwards. But right now, I wanted to say thanks so much, Bob, for taking the time to do this because this is information that we really are here, you know, hearing more uh, more about as more folks are dealing with Emerald Ash Borer in the states. And we have now 30 states that have Emerald Ash Borer, so I'm sure that uh, there's going to be more and more questions on what do we do to replace these dead ash. Um, and if you have anyone that has more questions, please feel free to email Bob or to myself. I will be sending out that email soon. We are getting pretty close to noon here. We are afternoon. So I'm going to finish this up, close down the meeting. And again, thanks so much, Bob, for, for helping us out at EAB University. And everyone, I hope you have a good day. Get out there and vote. All right. Thanks, everybody.